This is the primary debate for St. Louis County prosecutor between Robert McCulloch and Wesley Bell in Clayton, Missouri at Clayton High School for the St. Louis County prosecutor on August 7th. 2018. Hi, good evening. Welcome to Launching Justice, conversations with district attorney candidates hosted by the Players Coalition. We really appreciate everyone being here and a special thank you to Clayton High School for graciously hosting us today. The Players Coalition is an independent 501c3, 501c4 organization working with professional athletes, coaches, and owners across leagues to improve social justice and racial equality in our country. Their work is focused on three key pillars, police and community relations, criminal justice reform, and education and economic advancement. The Players Coalition is solution-oriented, and members invest significant time and resources to educate themselves on various issues impacting their communities to identify where their influence can have the greatest impact. Regrettably, uh, Chris Long, a leader in the Players Coalition and a member of the Philadelphia Eagles, flight was canceled uh, earlier today, and his second flight as well. So unfortunately, he's not going to be joining us this evening. Tonight's forum will be moderated by Judge Michael Wolf. Michael Lloyd Wolf is an attorney, former Missouri Supreme Court judge, and chief justice and professor and dean emeritus of St. University Law School. His current practice involves select matters related to litigation, governmental affairs, and public interest law. Wolf served for 13 years on the Supreme Court of Missouri from 1998 to 2011, including two years as Chief Justice from 2005 to 2007. He returned to the faculty of St. Louis University in 2011 and became Dean of the Law School in 2013, serving until 2014. Please welcome our moderator. Thank you. It's really nice to, to be here, and uh, I just want to start out by saying to, uh, thank you to the Players Coalition. I'm sitting in, even though I am not now, nor have I ever been a professional football player. <laughs> I just want to make that clear in case anybody was, was mistaken for something else. And uh, so I, I know that uh, the Players Coalition, including Chris Long, have taken a great interest uh, in the issues that are raised in prosecutors' races. Uh, because of their belief that our, that our justice system is, in a sense, broken. Mass incarceration, the school-to-prison pipeline, cash bail, police shootings that continue to plague uh, various communities around the country, including St. Louis County, the state of Missouri, uh, in fact, the whole country. So it's our most vulnerable and historically marginalized communities within uh, our region uh, people of color, people living in poverty, who are most harmed by this system. More than any other governmental official, it is a, the elected prosecuting attorney who has the power to shape and to change criminal justice policy. Because every day the prosecuting attorney makes decisions that have enormous impact on the people of this county. The prosecuting attorney and his, and his staff decide who is charged and with what crime decides who gets diverted away from the criminal justice system and who must carry the burden of a criminal conviction. He decides when to seek prison sentences and for how long. The prosecuting attorney decides whether to seek rehabilitation or to emphasize retribution. Um, it's clear that the prosecuting attorney's power, the power to prosecute and the power to sentence, and also the power to seek mercy and second chances, comes with this immense responsibility to the public with your votes, all of you, you will decide who will be, be your prosecuting attorney. For that reason, we're pleased to have the opportunity to at least uh, hear from one of the candidates uh, for this important office. Um, I should say that uh, in introducing the candidates, I'll start by saying the incumbent, Bob McCullough, if you have a chair for him, in case he does show up. I, I got this assignment just a short while ago and I sent him an email saying, why don't you come? Got no, 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 don't have any other plans, but I uh, haven't heard. Uh, uh, Bob, uh, by the way, has served as prosecuting attorney in St. Louis County. This is, I think, his 28th year. Um, I did the math. The county became a separate county in 1876, uh, so that he served prosecuting attorney for roughly 15% of the time that the county's been in existence, just for those of you who are keeping score. Um, but here with us today, importantly, um, is Wesley Bell, uh, who is a candidate uh, uh, 
running against Bob McCullough in the primary uh, in August. Uh, uh, he's running as a progressive black defense attorney. He's a city council member in Ferguson, and he's running for the first time uh, for prosecuting attorney. After graduating from the University of Missouri-Columbia School of Law, uh, Wesley Bell started his career at the Special Public Defender's Office. In 2013, he was appointed a judge and later as municipal court prosecutor in Riverview, uh, Missouri, and they consolidated, and he's been a prosecutor in the consolidated municipal courts. He has been uh, criticized, I think, for his roles there, where he helped implement uniform fine schedules across St. Louis County, as well as presided over the first court to implement a universal amnesty program for citizens recalling all nonviolent municipal warrants after 2014. In 2015, the city of Ferguson elected Wesley Bell as a city councilman. Uh, he played a key role in part of the negotiation team for the city of Ferguson with the Department of Justice. He helped to negotiate and pass the Ferguson Consent Decree, which has brought the most comprehensive community policing and court reforms in the region to the city of Ferguson. Wesley lives in Ferguson. He's an alumnus of Hazelwood High School East and Lindenwood University. Um, so that is my introduction of, um, of Wesley Bell. And uh, he is uh, going to uh, start us off. Uh, you're the only candidate here today. So we're going to have you do an opening statement of a couple minutes just to uh, introduce yourself to this uh, fine audience. and then. Uh, the Players Coalition has provided me with uh, a list of penetrating questions. Uh, I'm not sure they're penetrating, but again, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll get to them and we'll get, we'll, we'll, I think we'll have a robust discussion here. But also, in the audience, you'll see you, there's little three by five cards that, that are there. And if you have questions as this uh, discussion continues, please write your question down and give it to somebody who will be up available to pick up the question, we'll take those up uh, toward, the end of, uh, toward the end of the presentation. So, you're open and safe. Uh, first, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for, to the Players Coalition for hosting this. Uh, thank you for being our uh, super sub. Um, uh, Chris Long actually sent me a tweet apologizing for not being here, and I, that was really cool to me. <laughs> So uh, that was kind of exciting. Uh, I got to know something to set up here. Hopefully Bob doesn't mind. Uh, uh, so yeah, again, my name is Wesley Bell. Um, I do uh, serve as a Ferguson City Councilman in Ward 3. Um, I, um, and, we, and I did serve on the negotiating committee to uh, not only help write, but also pass the, the uh, consent decree. And, bringing co uh, community policing to St. Louis County as well as court reforms, and not just in Ferguson, but working to bring these types of reforms throughout the region. Uh, and so we know that there's more to do, uh, but when we look from wh whence we came, I think you can see uh, tangible uh, strides in the, in the right direction, but again, I, I want to emphasize we got more to do. Um, also, I've, I've uh, started my career as a public defender um, through undergrad, I interned in the public defender's office and special in the special public defender's office once I uh, once I graduated. So I got a chance to uh, work in not only the city but the county and some of the rural areas. And working with this prosecutor's office, um, you know, people people say, "Well, uh, you, you didn't work in that particular office." And to be quite frank, uh, that that was a choice that I made because I couldn't work in that office. Uh, with the things that I saw that, that, we're, that we're doing, that we're going to talk about um, uh, during this event, during this debate, um, <laughs> the things that were going on in that office, I would have been fired because I could not have, I would not have stood by them. Um, is that my phone? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so <I> said, <laughs> Xavier has me mic'd up with his phone, and I'm like, if you didn't turn your phone on. Um, but yeah, so there. So in addition to working um, with this prosecutor's office, but then working in just about every capacity in the criminal justice system, what I've seen is that the system is broken. There, are, there are need. There is a strong need for reform, um, and just like a lot of people in this room, uh, 
August 2014 was an awakening moment for a lot of us. As a, as a younger attorney at that time, um, I knew that there were problems in many of our courts, but I didn't know the scope of them. And so I'm, I'm proud to be one of the people, along with many people in this room, that once we were made aware of these problems, many of us stepped up to the plate. And we're continuing to do that because this is something that we continue, that we'll continue to need to work work toward. Thank you. Um. Start right off with the coalitions. Uh, we've got this kind of organized. They've got this kind of organized by topics. The first is uh, policing, accountability, and really getting to the issue of racial disparities. Um, let's face it: throughout Missouri, discriminatory policing continues to drive racial disparities uh, in the criminal justice system. In St. Louis County, only 25 percent of the population is black, but black drivers. Um, account for about, I think, 40% of vehicular stops. Uh, they're also searched, arrested, and jailed at a higher rate than whites, even though white drivers are more likely to have illegal items in their car. So the first question that comes from that is, if elected prosecuting attorney, how will you use your prosecutorial discretion uh, to eliminate discriminatory policing practices? Well, one, one thing that we know, that, that is a fact, that African Americans are much more likely to be, um, to come in contact with the criminal justice system um, than, than whites. Um, we, we know that. Um, and, and growing up in North St. Louis County, I was one who um, was pulled over several times, taken out of the car, the car searched. Um, and I look at it from, from my perspective. I mean, I was not, and my mom said, she knew I was not a threat to anyone. I was a typical kid into talking to girls on, on the phone, because that's all we did back then, is talk to them, talk on the phone, uh, playing tech mobile. These are the kind of things that I did as a teenager. And so I was, I was pulled over enough um, in my teenage to young, um, young in my early 20s that I didn't think that there was, I didn't think it was a big deal. And I literally, I've told the story before, I literally did not know that it, there was something wrong until I got to law school. And I'm reading the case law, and I'm like, come on, this, this wasn't right. Um, so we know that this happens. We know that African American males make up about 8% of the population in Missouri, but yet make up close to 40% of the prison population. So we know that these racial disparities exist. We know that they must be addressed, and I think that it starts with transparency. Um, if I get the honor of serving as your next prosecutor, um, we're going to publish. We're going to publish the data with respect to who we're prosecuting, who the, who's being pulled over, who's being arrested, uh, because I think that's the only way that you can address the issue. Is that, is that if you're open and honest and transparent about what you're doing, how can you improve your practices if you don't know what your practices are and you're not being honest? And if there are individual prosecutors that are um, that are um, that are doing these kind of practices, then they need to be corrected or potentially removed. I know that there's a lot of prosecutors in that office that I know that um, I'm not going to say that, but there's there's several that need to go. Uh, I'm just going to say that. But there's some that um, would benefit from a change of culture. And again, there's going to be some people that we need to bring in. But um, these are issues that I think start with transparency. Start with publishing this data. Um, start with um, being clear with our policies and making sure that everyone knows what those policies are. Um, you know, St. Louis County is, uh, uh, especially since 2014, known throughout the country for the police involved shooting of Michael Brown, as well as the fact that the officer, Darren Wilson, was not indicted for causing his death. So the we, so we start with a very high profile case, but we know that uh, there are continue to be uh, shoot uh, and kill young black men. A Department of Justice investigation found frequent instances of excessive for use of force used against people of color in this community, including unnecessary use of tasers and canines, with no fear from law enforcement that there would be consequences for their, con for their conduct. So police accountability, and this is Police Players Coalition's concern, is urgent in that communities all over the country 
faces they look to local officials, especially the prosecuting attorney, to break this cycle. So the question is, will you investigate and hold police accountable for misconduct, including fatal shootings and the use of, of uh, excessive force? And I suppose it's fair to ask, well, how, how will you do so? So, uh, first and foremost, let's, let's be clear. Um, the prosecutor's office and law enforcement officers work very closely together. Um, even working in the municipal courts, I have the opportunity to work with, with a lot of officers. And there is inherently, there's going to develop friendships. Um, and, there, and, and again, there is, a, there is a clear conflict of interest when you work that closely together. So first and foremost, with, with cases involving police shootings, you, we have to implement a policy of a special prosecutor. As much as I trust myself to be fair, um, I want to be clear on this point. As much as I trust myself to be fair, it's not just about me. And um, one thing that we do in a community policing initiative, I'm going to digress just for a second, is that we host groups on the police simulator. And that's so that people can come in free of charge, interact with officers, ask tough questions, and start building some of those um, bridging some of those divides. One of the officers that I work with, Captain Farmer, has become one of my best friends. And so if someone accused Captain Farmer of using excessive force, as fair as I think that I can be, I, inherently, I, there's going to be some doubt in my mind because I know him, because he's a, he's a friend of mine. And so we have to implement policies that actually work, that hold people accountable, just like everyone in this room is held accountable for their, for their actions, even our officers who have the toughest job in the world, and we want to give them all the support that they need, but they still need to be held accountable if they, if they violate the law. And so in addition to a policy of having a special prosecutor, what I think is most important, and I'm going back to the theme of the day of transparency, is that we are going to have a policy that is published and made public, so you can read from the script if there's ever an accusation of police um, Police, uh, police shooting or police excessive force. You will know exactly what our office uh, will be doing. You'll be able to see it and we'll follow that uh, because without transparency, you can't have trust. I, I, I'll follow up with that question about because the prosecuting attorney is elected, which means you have to get campaign support, campaign donations. Will you accept that from police organizations? And, and by the way, you're not in any danger of getting them now. But yes. <laughs> now, that's the question I was not prepared for. <laughs> because the, the, the support that I get is, hey, we're with you, but, you know, we can't be public. We can't go public. That's what I get. That's the answer I get from a lot of officers. So there's a lot of officers that, that are supporting my campaign. Um, but um, I, I would imagine you mean in, in Running for re-election? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's a good question. Um, I think that I think that man, I, I, I'd have to think that one through. Uh, it would be not, you know I, I I don't see why that would change the policy, but um, but man, I'd have to I guess I'd have to think about that one. I I, I really would. That's you, you caught me with that. I was, I, I, they caught you. I, I'm okay. No, good question. I, I'd like to. It is. It is a good yeah. question. I mean, question sometimes comes up when someone gets elected to office, it's sort of like the, uh, the scene in the, in the New Testament of uh, Jesus and the temptation, you know, showing you the, all the wonderful things, right? Uh, and will you succumb to that temptation? That's really the kind of question that this is. So we can move to the broader question. It isn't the broader question about campaign finance reform. Yeah, yeah, and that's some of us. I think we, money is at the root of, is the root of all evil when it comes to our, our government, our politics, and and so that's something that I would advocate for. Um, and, and yeah, I would definitely want to, I'd have to consider that. You know, it's also, we live in a country, in fact, we might even be the only country in the world that's crazy enough to elect prosecutors. Okay, I mean. I won't take exception to it. You won't touch it. <laughs> okay, so I'm not the candidate, I'm going to let him. Um, the uh, Players Coalition was concerned about uh, a wanted system that they say exists in a place like St. Louis County, you know, where they detain people who the police want to talk to or the prosecutor wants to talk to, even though the 
individual that's being detained, not accused of a crime. Uh, it's a practice that seems to, to disproportionately affect minorities uh, and people of color. And first of all, what do you think of this practice? And, and, and how extensive is it and should and would you end it? So the wanted system is a way of, of a warrant without a warrant. Um, it, it's a way for to say, well, we, we, we're just we're not arresting them. We're just uh, they just want it for questioning, and I and I believe that it's unconstitutional. I think that it's um, I think it's unethical personally, and I and um, I don't intend to re to issue on cases that come out of, of the wanted system. And I think that's some of what the prosecutor's office can do. We can't change every practice, but we can change the behavior. If officers know that if you are using the wanted system, we're not going to issue on those cases. And as a former public defender, um, yeah, I've been frustrated with with the wanted system uh, uh, throughout my legal career.